Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from Outer of space. space. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one, Unfit for Human Consumption, written by Zephyrland Dentist. Salarum! Bera almost shouted at the senior xenoanthropologist. I'm in it! Her top set of ears wiggled enthusiastically. I found something the humans don't eat! Really? The senior Elenum researcher didn't even flinch an ear as he continued to study the screens in front of him. Very well, enlighten me, he sighed. Nests, Mera exclaimed happily. Nests, as in the place the avians lay eggs and rest their young. Indeed. These are made of collected pieces of foliage that are unfit for human consumption. She was jumping for joy at the prospect of an additional day off. Hmm, how were the contender, Bera? Zalarum almost offered a smile. But, uh, look up, Swiftlet. Mera looked at her senior's back. Really? Uh, they, they eat nests? Yep. But, unfit for consumption, she murmured. After that, look up ethanol and capsaicin. Drex. End of story. Story number two. Slip Space, written by For Use at Works. Selected excerpts from the Utlib Military Academy Historical Database. Military. Status declassified. Type lecture notes. Autoscribe system B38.3. Subject Humanity. Cross reference first contact FDL. The Enemicus Conflict. Speaker Adjunct Professor Viro Gaioris Colonel, United Terran Defense Fleet. Retired. Class, please come to order, barked Colonel Grigals. You may all be wondering why we are here today, as you all have officially graduated and gotten your commission and security clearances as newly hatched baby officers. A murmur passed over the class, the leap version of a polite chuckle. Colonel Grigals paused and swept a dark brown human eyes across the auditorium at a cacophony of colors and patterns of leap exoskeletons, that have been polished to a military sheen. For many of you, I am the only human that you have ever directly interacted with, he stated. Because of this fact, it is my privilege to provide you with the first classified briefing, he continued. While this material is more than 50 sole years old and rumors abound about it in the public sphere, it is practically an open secret. But it has been tradition ever since the end of the Inmicus conflict to tell the story to each graduation class of fleet officers, spoke Grigors in a tightly controlled clipped voice. So in the words of my grandfather, get comfortable children, I'm gonna tell you a story. The year was 2261 by the Soul calendar. Ten years had passed since the first contact with the Italy confab. Our two species had gotten on really well. Humanity hadn't yet discovered slip space travel when the first Atleep surveyor ship entered the Sol system, but we had left the cradle of Earth and had colonized Mars and multiple moons of our system's gas giant planets. We even had a couple of research stations in our Oort cloud. We had discovered life in our system, nothing sentient, but humanity knew that we weren't alone in the universe. Based on our technology level at the time, our new Atleep friends estimated that we would have discovered the basic principles of slip space in a decade or two, and would have been able to build crude drive systems within 15 years of that. So they didn't have much concern about upsetting our society by introducing themselves. By 2270, we had established contracts with the several Atleep companies to transport some of our first colonists to new worlds. It was on one of these first colony ships where the story really begins. The ECMF at Leap Cofab Merchant Fleet, Ultra Heavy Transport, Lacus, was starting its life as a military transport. It was a bit smartened, but was robust, could move 250 standard cargo modules through slip space, and sported 10 attached landers that could ferry parts to and from orbit. When she was decommissioned and demilitarized, she was purchased by one of her former captains, one Monotractus. He took the job of moving the first wave of colonists to Kepler-438b, now known as the Novan Domen. You may recall that this is one of the pirate attacks that set off the Imicus conflict. We covered that enough in class, though. Here's what you don't know. When that lightly disguised Inimicus frigate jumped from the outer fringes of the system into Novan Doman's gravity well, 
They came out of slip space in near perfect position. The only thing that saved the Lacus from being outright destroyed in the first volley of torpedoes is that Captain Monitor still ran his bridge like it was in a confab military fleet. As soon as the jumped signatures were detected, the crew activated Lacus's substantial shields. Demilitarization may have removed all but the basic point defense turrets from the ship, but her shields, while old, were strong and had been well maintained over the years. Those shields took four direct torpedoes before they faltered and ate away 90% of the energy of the fifth. That is where it seemed that the Lacus's luck ran out. The fifth torpedo hit the bridge. On this day, Captain Manitritus, as he was done many times before on the 17th month's trip to Novendomen, had let one of the human children's school classes tour the bridge. This was a special occasion as the children could watch and listen as the ferry shuttle containers down to their soon-to-be new home. The torpedo killed ten of the 14 third-grade children, their teacher, and all of the bridge crew except the navigator. Bulkheads had closed and emergency structural fields sealed the atmosphere of the bridge. But it was chaos. The injured children wailed as alarms blared and the fire suppression systems extinguished the flames and evacuated acrid smoke from the chamber. The Eclipse Navigator, Lieutenant Samantavis Querpeta, was fatally wounded but kept calm. She activated the emergency escape protocol with a voice command to her console. But nothing happened. Now you see the dilemma. While the ship had fully functional and charged slip drive, a captain who followed standard military protocol and had emergency escape calls loaded whenever in real space, a valiant navigator trying her best to do her duty, the Lacus had no helmsman. That is one quirk of slip space that keeps all of us bags of fluid and meat on our ships versus handling all over to computers. A slip capable ship needs a sentient being to direct its travel. Even to this day, we don't know why. Just the act of a sentient being activating a drive somehow gives the ship authority to surgically slice a tiny tear into space-time and allows it to emerge across the galaxy. Not even the most advanced AI can do it. Every AI test, every remote activation of a drive that has been attempted has resulted in a lost ship or the vessel being converted into subatomic particles and energy. The only other sentience on that bridge were scared, wounded, human children. Semitivis Querperta called them in a calm and soothing voice. Children, children, listen to me. We have to run away. We have to run now. We can do it, but I need your help. Who can get into the big red chair? Children, I, I know you're scared, but I need you to help us run away. I need you to help save your mommies and daddies and brothers and sisters. The human flight or fight response is interesting. Most untrained humans will flee a dangerous situation. Some will freeze up. But some without any training to guide them will turn icy cold. We were lucky that one such little boy was on that bridge. His name was Tavian. He was nine years old. He had sandy brown hair and was wearing tiny coveralls made by his mother to resemble a human fleet crewman's clothing. He had visited the bridge every time he could, and the engine room, and the recycler rooms, and everywhere else outside the passenger modules that he could. Where some kids could name every dinosaur, he could name dozens of fleet ships by sight. He knew what all of the controls did. With a jagged metal shard embedded in his small femur, he dragged himself up into the helmsman's chair and slapped the small hand down on the control panel, leaving a bloody print. This itself is not a significant event. Humans have been piloting slip-capable ships for years at this point, under the Yipleaves watchful eyes. Exquisitely trained expert human adults. Humans strained to know that slip space was weird, but had rules. You can only jump so far. You can only jump so fast. Slip space seems is fluid, though. Sometimes you would emerge from a long jump to find that five days had passed and you had gone 15 light years. Sometimes you would find that 20 days had passed and that you had gone and traveled seven light years. Slip space was moody. Only short, almost line of sight jumps could be made with accuracy and precision. 
At best, you would aim for the general vicinity of a solar system during a long jump, and then micro-jump and real space transit the remaining distance. When scared, brave little Tavian hit the panel. They jumped. Only they didn't just jump. They jumped home. They jumped 473 light years in an instant. They jumped into Earth's gravity while only 2,000 kilometers above the surface of the planet. They jumped directly over Tavian's former house in the city called Huntsville. That is what won the Inimicus conflict, cemented the bond between Eclipse and humans, and brought us to become the dominant power in this corner of the galaxy. As we don't have child soldiers, you are probably wondering why every ship in both military and civilian fleets has an adult human pilot. It turns out that our species has a superpower. We may not be the strongest, fastest, or smartest species in the galaxy, but we can do one thing better than anyone else. That thing is self-delusion. For the whole history of our species, we have built realities in our mind that didn't fit the real-world data. We see patterns where there are none. We believe in possible things just because that is how we would prefer that the universe should be. It has both plagued our species and helped us hold on to survive in possible situations. Now, our stubborn ability to deny reality has been harnessed to open the universe up to us both. We can travel between star systems in an instant now, because of one disciplined Adleep captain, one stalwart Adleep helmsman, and one frightened but brave little human boy who wanted more than anything to go home. End of story. This is a special thank you to the one, the only, the legendary Erak Hino who has become the only Tier 6 patron. I just want to thank the T5 patrons and channel members. Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Australia the Dreamer, Trigger95, Pudic Yol, Meridian117, Elithia, Jordan Buxborn, Angry Marine, Albarden Gasta, and Barky. Thank you very much. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. There are links down below, both to support this channel and for the author of this fiction. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic one, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.